Welcome to the Plant-Based Podcast. Did you know that plants are truly amazing? Not only can you grow them and eat them, you can also wear them, drink them, nourish your skin with them, and so much more. Let Ellen and Michael inspire you to love plants as much as they do, as they chat with the movers and shakers in this wonderful plant-based world. So, let's dig in. Hey guys, it's Mr. Plant Geek here. I'm just introducing the next of our summer specials. And this is a mini Plant Geeks podcast. We'll be talking about a plant that you may or may not know. Well, you'll probably know it by a different name, actually. We're going to be talking about Antorhinum. Now, any English listeners will know this as Snapdragon. Now, this is a plant that you probably look past when you're in the garden centre because it kind of can be very brightly coloured, kind of looking very normal. And it was used a lot in Victorian times, but there are an amazing range of varieties. There are cut flower types. You've often seen these in bouquets, the kind of bubblegum coloured ones, the white ones. They've got amazing fragrance, great cut flower ability. Do you like my new word there? There are also some hardy varieties that are coming through, ones that you can grow in baskets as well, they trail, and ones with big orchid flowers. So I actually visited Wim of Prestige Plants and we talked about Antorhinums and his breeding programs as well. So I hope you'll really, really enjoy this episode where we're really kind of looking at a plant that was traditionally seen as quite a cheap bedding plant and what the future is for this amazing plant and the whole genus, actually. So, oh, I've just noticed in my front garden I'm growing some antirhinums. That is very, very on topic for the episode. But to be honest, they're becoming a bit engulfed by the verbena bonariensis. But then what else... What doesn't get engulfed by Verbena bonariensis? I'm just looking now. Cow parsley, that's holding its own, at least. Anyway, I've got something cool to tell you all about. Ellen and I are doing a sponsored walk. It's going to be 20 miles, which my calculations tell me are about 40,000 steps. Because, of course, these days we think of everything in steps, don't we? In our health app, on our iPhone, etc., etc. So we are doing this for the feed in Norwich. So they are an organisation who try and help with poverty and hunger and homelessness around the Norwich area. And the walk will be from Reefham to Norfolk, not Norfolk, Norwich, (laughs) which is in Norfolk, of course. So we're actually going to be walking 20 miles across the Norfolk countryside. Some of it is on an old railway as well. I'm really looking forward to it, actually, because I don't mind walking. And even last weekend, I did about 20,000 steps. I think Ellen was quite impressed, actually. Um, So when I can be bothered, I am I'm quite lively and fit, you know? Anyway, let's see how we do. Please, please, please do sponsor us. And more importantly, sponsor me more than you'd sponsor Ellen to help me smash my target and um, annihilate hers. But either way, we would like your money for this project. So thank you very much. There will be all the information on our social media platforms, or we will um, also put it on our own platforms as well as the plant-based podcast ones as well. Right, so this is the point where I complain about the weather. It is dull again. I've had my heating on. It is like 15 degrees outside. What is happening? If there was ever a conspiracy I would believe in, it would be the weather. So anyway, I'm set up in my office again because my partner's away for a few weeks. So I've actually got the run of the place. So yeah, of course, it's a bit lonely, but I can finally get on with some work, almost in peace, as it were, because I'm actually writing a book. I'm writing a book and I need to have it finished in about seven weeks, actually. But it's about all sorts of cool and interesting plants. So there'll be more news on that soon enough. I'm also filming a few workshops for my Barakura Japanese garden that I work with a lot. And I'm at Cactus World Live on Bank Holiday Weekend as well. So that is on Sunday, the 29th of August. Plus, ITV This Morning is coming up again. We've also got Steph's Pack Lunch. So there's tons going on. And... I've had my hall painted. It's teal. I hope you like it. Have a little look online. Meanwhile, enjoy the antirhinums. 
aka snapdragons. You know, the ones that you make into little bunny rabbits when you're a kid. See ya. So I'm here today in Holland with Wim van Marowijk, and we are going to talk about Antorhinums, which is a really traditional plant that you may recognize the name of. If I say Snapdragon, you might recognize that name as well. But there has been so much development in the last few years and single-handedly done by Wim as well. So welcome to the podcast. Today we're going to talk through Antorhinums, the whole world of Antorhinums, kind of where did your love of them come from? So, yeah, tell us a little bit about your background, first of all, though. You were always playing with plants when you were a child? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. I think the love for plants I have from my grandfather. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was uh, a nurseryman. He had his own nursery, uh, was growing snapdragons in the past as a uh -huh. flower. Uh, but especially my grandfather, uh, who was always looking for specialties, etc., etc., has really uh, catched uh, my interest for special things uh, like Enterhinum and the species, because normally we're only talking about Mayas. Mm -hmm. But at the moment you go deeper into it, uh, you see there is a tremendous amount of variation mm -hmm. and a lot of species, which makes the crop very interesting. Mm -hmm. So Enterhinums as a plant, where did they originate from? Uh, Antorhinums originally uh, come from the Medi Mediterranean, mm -hmm. uh, from Portugal to Syria, uh, a little bit in northern Africa, and uh, in southern France you can also see something, but that is, let's say, the area where you can find a mm -hmm. crop. Okay, and how did they really come to Europe to be used as bedding plants? Because they were used in a lot of Victorian bedding displays? They're certainly a kind of plant of our yesteryears, aren't they? Yeah, uh, it's, it's especially, I think, uh, the plant has been more important in the UK gardens in the past mm -hmm. as it was over here. Okay. Uh, I think mainly at a moment when it was introduced as a cut flower, uh, it has gained interest from mm -hmm. a lot of people in, uh, let's say, continental Europe. And from that point, people have been looking more and more in diversifying the crop itself, where it came thanks to uh, available species by botanical gardens, mm -hmm. to more breeding of the material. And we went into what I call the first generation of pot-based material. Okay, because traditionally they were kind of border plants, big, bold, brash colors. Um, also, the Madame Butterfly is an open-faced one, which is quite classic. Yep. That's been around for a long time, right? That's, that's quite long. Mm. Of, of, and that's another one that you're bringing into kind of dwarf form as well. So yep. there's lots of different breeding work that's going on here to do with Antorhinums. But also part of that focuses on hardiness as well, because they can sometimes be going as a perennial as well. They yep. come back every year. Uh, now, uh, in regard to, uh, to the range of species, there are species which are quite hardy, uh, mm -hmm. hardiness, but the most interesting thing is even combining one hardy with another hardy, we get even more hardy material. Mm -hmm. And we have now some varieties which even uh, survive by minus 12 degrees. Wow, that's pretty cool. It almost brings yeah. it into a completely different kind of category. It's almost like you'd expect to find those snapdragons in the perennial section of the garden center or kind of, it's almost like a mini shrub, perhaps. Yeah, no, I, th I think that is until now a little bit disappointing that people seeing it still as a, as a fast flowering, mm. uh, yeah, short life cycle crop, where I think with the material, we are now that far that we have uh, varieties which can be grown as a shrub, mm -hmm. yeah, having it already flowering, uh, let's say, in February because they are day length neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most important thing, uh, they remain flowering all the season, yeah, till the end of September, early October. So it's a completely di different type of enterhinum as people were used to in the past. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's talk about your breeding for a minute, actually. So first of all, you're doing the hardy, shrubby types. Yeah. You're also looking at fragrance, dwarf. I know there's a couple of names that people might recognize. Antarinkas and Antiradoras. Yes. They're both from you, and they yeah. almost changed the face of Antarinas yeah. when they were released, yeah. what, probably about 15 years ago? Uh, that's around 12 years ago. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 12 years ago, we introduced that material. Uh, that was in that time uh, in a close cooperation uh, with dear friend uh, Fred Yates, mm -hmm. with whom uh, we had quite a close cooperation. And uh, after that, we have maintained uh, developing more and more material, bringing other species in, because it was quite clear that Enterhinum itself 
has such a tremendous, uh, yeah, let's say, frame in which you can develop the varieties that we see every year again, we see impressive new developments in the crop where I think, mm -hmm. uh, where does it end with, with Interrhinum itself? I mean, when, when we see where we started and where we are at this moment, it's a completely different crop as it yeah. was in the past. That's amazing. And we're not talking seed raised here. No. This is all cutting raised, which was actually something that was very avant-garde for the Antarana yeah. market when you started doing that 12 years yeah. ago. How was yeah. that received? Um, it was received in the beginning quite skeptical. Mm. Yeah. Because suddenly uh, you've got a plant that was 99 pence for a packet and now you're charging someone 99 pence for one plant. Yeah. So it's very yeah, the, the, the beginning we had, let's say, and then we are going back to the, to the first launch of cutting race material that was the Enterinum Sweetheart series. Okay. Uh, Sweetheart series was fragrant, uh, was compact, uh, no growth retardant uh, required, uh, but single colors. Mm -hmm. uh, that was interesting because it was day length neutral and gave growers the opportunity to be much earlier in the market and to have a very nice 13 centimeter pot uh, product where the, the seed trays were either smaller or much taller. Mm -hmm. So we had a very nice, uh, let's say, on the shelf product. Uh, from that on, we said, uh, this is too easy to copycat mm -hmm. uh, what we have seen happening in the market and we want to do something special. And then we achieved to get the Antirodora, Antirinka, we had some other things. And now we are going to the next level where we think we want to have shrubby types, rockery mm -hmm. garden types. Nice. Uh, but main target for me is still that I want to have let's say, a real hanging enterrhinum with double flowered mm -hmm. and fragrance. And uh, I have another 15 years to go for it. Like but a it's rival really to a Tumbelina yeah. Petunia, yeah. for yeah. example. Yeah, it's mm. really something where I want to end up. There uh -huh. is the focus. Oh, wow. So that would be a double, so that would be an open face type flower. Yeah. So can we talk about those open type kind of faces for a moment? So Madame Butterfly was one of the first types, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And then obviously others have been bred from there. Are they actually better for bees and pollinating insects because of the access um, compared to traditional? In, in regard, uh, let's, the interesting thing is that they produce more pollen. Okay. So in that way they are, oh. more, uh, they are more interesting. But because of the shape of the flower, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, setting seed is more difficult. Uh -huh. So we have, let's say, two advantages. First of all, it's, more attract it's attracting more bees and bumblebees, but it's also because of the shape of the flower, it's setting less, uh, less seeds, so it, contain, uh, it maintains much more flowering, mm -hmm. uh, which gives, let's say, the second advantage for, uh, for the bees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's great. So it's flowering for longer, but it's still giving nectar to the bees. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. Okay, and how about fragrance? So there's obviously a fragrance in a lot of antirhinums that is often described as bubblegum-like. Um, well, how would you describe it? And does the fragrance differ between different species and varieties? Um, now, first of all, uh, between varieties, I think everybody who ever bought uh, the three colors of the Antiradora mm -hmm. series has been surprised that it were three completely really? different. Really? Uh, I mean, one, the yellow one is much more uh, what we call a citron type uh, fragrance. Uh, the pink one was truly bubblegum, like mm -hmm. you call. And we had the purple who had a more um, peppery uh, taste in it. So there is, even in the Antiridora, we had really different uh, things. And mm -hmm. it looks like it's a little bit connected to the color. So okay. the, the mm -hmm. color and the fragrance is in connection with, with each other because we see it every time back that uh, certain colors are going to certain uh, fragrances. Uh, but when you see in the species, there is a big difference in species because when you call uh, Molle itself has no fragrance. Uh, mm -hmm. The Blanchette, uh, Brown Blanchette has no fragrance. And mm -hmm. there are just a few which have fragrance and the interesting thing, and which makes it also difficult, it's not always going on from one cross to the other, but it comes back the third or the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we need more time, and because we know it will come, yeah, because it's always coming back in certain, in certain crosses, uh, we have to take a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Okay.
And how about we touched on basket antarhinums a little bit just now, that's your dream to create a double yeah. trailing variety. What trailing varieties are out there in the marketplace at the moment? Are there any that are truly trailing or is it a bit of a hodgepodge? Now, I, th I think when you, you see there has been a variety called Avalanche in the past, which mm -hmm. was quite uh, quite good hanging, but because of the foliage, uh, which was more a woolly type of foliage, mm -hmm. it uh, was attracting a lot of water, so it gave uh, in the autumn always problems of damping off. Mm -hmm. uh, we have had the, the series of uh, the floral showers, which I think is not a truly mm -hmm. hanging, but it was uh, what I call a floppy type of yeah. varieties, yeah. which was falling over. I think over people the, often, yeah. like breeders often try and market floppy varieties yeah. as trailing. I've seen yeah. that, like with carnations, for example. Yeah. They're just carnations that fell over at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay, and there was a really traditional mix that you used to see in a lot of mail order catalogs called Chinese lanterns. Yeah. Well, is, is that a good mix or is that just another? Uh, who am I to say something about the work of somebody else? I think uh, it's at least not what I want to achieve. I mean, uh -huh. I really want to have uh, varieties which has an excellent garden performance, mm -hmm. are mildew resistant, and uh, really giving people for a long time yeah, mm -hmm. a good performance in the garden. And what my experience so far with most of the seed raised uh, lines is that they are setting seeds too easy Mm -hmm. which stop them putting energy in flowers. Uh -huh. Yeah. And we touched on, uh, you touched on mildew there. Also, rust can be a problem yep. in antirhinums. I assume that you're breeding to protect the plants from that, but how can anybody treat their plants that are susceptible to rust? Is it terminal? Uh, in principle, when I talk with people about rust and you know my, my background, I'm mm -hmm. uh, working in the biology. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's one of the most important things uh, for people to spray uh, with what I call BioLeach. Mm -hmm. yeah? In, let's say, starting August, September, that's uh, a kind of silicium, mm -hmm. uh, natural silicium. And when you spray that over the plant, it makes your plant harder. Mm -hmm. yeah? and your cell structure stronger, and which makes the plant less, less susceptible uh -huh. to mildew. Okay, and rust, is there any way out from rust? No, I mean, I mean, uh, it works against rust. It's also a fungi. Ah, yeah. so it's gonna so work it, the it same. It works both, both ways. Oh, yeah. awesome. Okay, before we move on, just gonna talk a bit about cut flower types, because I don't know if you've bred any or not, but they're obviously a market where a lot of people in the UK are growing a lot of their own cut flowers. You know, it's become quite a thing to have antirhinums that are 30, 40 centimeters high. What would be your kind of pick of the varieties for those? Um, now, we are not looking at the moment into it. I mean, mm. we are in contact with uh, a cut flower breeder who is quite interested because of the, the incredible uh, amount of different flower shapes mm -hmm. we have. And mm -hmm. he is keen to look if he can breed some of that material in his material. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, in the Netherlands, it's quite a big cut flower uh, product. Yeah. yeah. And it's gaining interest every year more and more because it's it's a living product and I think especially with the open flower varieties we have now which are not fading mm -hmm. yeah because you see with the, the traditional ones you see that the strong colors are always fading we see with this material it's not fading it makes it extra interesting for them mm -hmm. okay and in terms of any unusual species that deserve better recognition out there is there any that you can Think of, because there aren't many pure species antirhinums that we really grow in our gardens, is there? Uh, I think we are growing no species at all. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I think also when you go to the species itself, mm -hmm. um, yes, there might be some, but in general, when I see where we are now in comparison to, the, the, to let's say, the species itself, mm. this is so different to yeah. the species. And, and even in the color range, I mean, when you see original, you had the pinkish and the purples and straight yellows. And when you see now at the moment where we are in colors, I mean, you can't imagine any color and mm. you can find it. 
I remember um, when I was working at Thomas Morgan, we used to list Braun Blanquetti yeah. in the catalogue. That's yeah. just a kind of yellow scrambling yeah. little thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Kind of good for a rockery, but potentially nowhere else. So. Oh yeah, it, it is a variety we have been breeding with, and uh, it's causing always problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially when you want to do something with yellow varieties, because for me, a yellow has to stay yellow mm -hmm. and every breeding where we put uh, that variety into uh, as soon as the flower was visited by a bee yeah mm -hmm. it got brown spots on it mm -hmm. so i mean you you lose the clear uh, okay. color in it and mm -hmm. i mean also the habit of the variety itself is not what i think is the one we want to have for the pop market mm -hmm. It's amazing when you talk about the marks on the flower, there's so many things to consider when you're breeding a plant, a lot of things that consumers don't realize at all. Really incredible. Um, how about kind of um, for customers at home and listeners to the podcast, like and antirhinums, any kind of real tips on how to grow them? They're pretty straightforward as long as you don't get them too wet. Is that right? I think you're saying the right word. Mm. I, th I think the biggest problem is irregular watering. Yeah, okay. mm -hmm. uh, having them one day dry and then soaking them with, wa with water. But I think that's in general for every plant. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not nice when a plant gets dry, but mm -hmm. don't overwater it in them afterwards because your root system is then pushing up so much water into the plant that it's blowing up your plant mm -hmm. either either by gutation or by any stem disease because your stems are breaking open. Mm -hmm. I think with the material we have now, we can do a lot. It's much stronger and much more resistant uh, to all these circumstances as the varieties we launched five to 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's really also one of the things we are looking at because for me, it's not only the point that we have to deliver a nice product, mm -hmm. but the growers are, who are growing it can make such a nice product, but we are in Europe, we are exporting material mm. everywhere in every corner of Europe. So even the plants has to come straight forward out of the yeah. truck and still have a good performance in a garden center at that point. And I guess, you know, most kind of home gardeners are irregular waterers. You know, yeah. it's a difficult yeah. balance to yeah. keep, isn't yeah. it? But antirhinums, is it fair to say that once they're established, they're fairly drought tolerant? Yeah. 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 And a good... You know, they don't necessarily want a really nutritious soil either, do they? No, uh, no. They, they, I mean, even when you look where they're coming from, mm -hmm. most of them are developing on the very poor soil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Especially when you look around the Mediterranean in Turkey, yeah. I mean, the places where you can find them, yeah, uh, a lot of places are almost pure scent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, uh, it are varieties which are... Uh, salt tolerant, uh, they don't need a lot of uh, fertilizer. The most important thing also in your garden, at the moment you plant them, make sure that you give them one or two times decent water that they can develop their root system. Mm -hmm. And after that, it's a plant, as long as you put it in the garden itself, not in a container, but in a garden itself, you even don't have to care about it because okay. the crop mm -hmm. doesn't do it itself. So is it fair to say that to plant in the border is easier for people because then the watering regulates, you're not going to be overwatering, underwatering. Yes, but I think that's for almost every plant. Yeah. I mean, mm, even true, uh, true. I mean, when, when we talk about Calibacoa or, or Petunias, you see the same situation. Mm. I think in general, uh, the substrates we are using is a nice alternative to the soil, yeah. but it's nothing uh, in comparison to the soil itself. Yeah, yeah. true. I'm t um, testing out some self-watering containers at the moment, but I just I don't trust it. I'd rather kind of manage it myself and I'm worried they'll be drawing up water all the time, which is not good for the plants necessarily. So, okay, well, thank you. It's really interesting to learn more about your antirhinum breeding program, but I'm in your glass houses now. You're also breeding petunias and begonias. Can you give me just a couple of little snapshots of what you're up to there? Because it's, it's too good to miss out in the podcast. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let's say in petunia, um, I have been the first person who launched uh, Begonia Bonfire in the market. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm working in Begonia already since 2010. Uh, that's, that's 10 years and in 10 years we have made a tremendous development uh, where we started with uh, Boliviensis type. Mm -hmm. Boliviensis is now, let's say most of Boliviensis which is sold in the market now is seed trace material. Mm -hmm. We are still doing something with Boliviensis but that's mainly into uh, the direction of doubled flowers. Mm -hmm. 
um, but we are now gaining in the next direction where we really say we want to have uh, easier self-branching varieties, uh, which we try to achieve with several uh, new uh, interspecific crosses. Mm -hmm. But we also think that we have to make a more showy plant with no flower drop in the garden, because that's what we always hear in the, in the shopping centers and, uh, and the garden centers, that one of their complaints they have about begonias is the flower drop. So we are now mm -hmm. working very hard on double flowers and different flower types, okay. that okay. there is no flower drop anymore. Yeah. And importantly, it, it has to be a weather resistant variety. Okay, and petunias, you've got some real monsters. Yeah, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, I think I think petunia. Uh, everybody is breeding petunia. Uh -huh. Yeah, and everybody is uh, copycatting each yeah. other or going I, at least. I must admit, direction. until I walked in here today, I feel like I'd seen every petunia that existed. But this today has changed my world. Oh. Yeah, uh, I think what what we have done here is really uh, in close cooperation with uh, with an Amer American guy. Mm -hmm. We have developed here uh, tetrapolis, uh, which much bigger flowers mm -hmm. with a lot of variation on the plant itself uh, but also varieties which are very stable there is no gross retardant used on any of this material oh. and uh, i mean the color range is amazing and no flower is the same yeah wow they're big they're flouncy they're probably six eight inches across yeah. as well yeah. and they're real border petunias yeah. aren't they they're real they've got presence you know Amazing. Cool. Well, thank you very much for being on the podcast today. It was interesting to learn a lot more about antirhinums and a little sneak peek into the rest of your breeding. So thank you, Wim. Yeah, thank you. It was my thank pleasure you. too. The music for the Plant Based podcast is part of the song Grow by Mikey James. And our editor is Gareth Patch of Semi Echo. Semi Echo.